Hi there! Um, so today I am in Basel, Switzerland, speaking to you from Basel, and it's um, eight. P no, it's nine p.m. over here, and eight p.m. in the UK, and twelve noon Pacific, three p.m. New York. This is amazing that I can speak to all of you all over the world. I love this. And if you've tuned in, please let me know in the comments where you're tuning in from and what time it is for you. And maybe you're in Australia or Asia or wherever you are. I'd love to hear from you. So today is Wayne Dyer's birthday. So that's the first thing I want to say is happy birthday, Wayne, because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. I am always so grateful to Wayne for um you know for discovering my story and for encouraging me to write the book and for getting hay house to publish it because i just love what i do and this you know and the ability to travel around the world and meet so many of you i just love that and speaking of meeting so many of you so i'm here on my european tour right now and i get an opportunity to meet so many of you in the different cities and my final stop will be bristol in the uk which uh, i'll be speaking there on the 2nd of june and i look forward to going to every place and meeting all of you but my publishers in the uk hay house in the uk have been so kind in that they're actually organizing a drinks party so that i can get to meet some of you so 10 people, 10 random people from the audience will be invited to this drinks party. And I'm looking forward to it because I always feel you all know so much about me and I know so little about all of you. And this gives me an opportunity to meet some of you. Um, and the way that they're gonna do it is that for everyone who has purchased their ticket by the 24th of May for the event in Bristol, your names go into a lucky draw, a hat, and 10 random names get picked and announced on the 25th of May. So the only thing is, is that you have to do is purchase your ticket before 24th of May. If you've bought your ticket already, there's nothing you have to do. And 10 people will be picked on the 25th and announced, and then we get to have drinks together on Hay House. They're treating us, and we get to, um, you know, I, I get to chat with you and answer whatever questions you want, but I also get to ask you questions, which will be kind of fun for me actually and so anyway um, this video I have titled it uh, am I an empath or a doormat and <clears throat> so I hope nobody takes this in a derogatory way because actually it refers to myself and um, prior to getting cancer prior to having the near-death experience I truly was a doormat and I want to say that people who are super sensitive, people who are empaths, are very susceptible to becoming doormats, hence this provocative title. So tell me if you relate to it. Tell me that if you are somebody who's super sensitive, who often crosses the border into becoming a doormat. Um, and really, if you are somebody who is an empath, not all empaths are doormats, but uh, empaths are uh, many empaths are a little more susceptible to becoming doormats than people who are less empathetic or who um, who are less sensitive to the emotions of the people around them. And so for me, I was a doormat and drained myself. So when you become a doormat, uh, you allow yourself to be walked all over by everybody around you until the point you get drained. And I got drained to the point of getting cancer. And this is why this subject is close to my heart and why I often talk about being an empath or being super sensitive and why I often talk about being a doormat. And sometimes it really is a fine line between the two. You know, it's all very well for us to say, hey, I'm really sensitive, I'm an empath, and that's why I do all this. But you really got to turn inwards and say, am I doing it because I'm feeling the emotions, which you probably are, but or, um, and you probably are feeling the emotions, but are you doing the things you're doing that drain you because in actuality you're a doormat and you're afraid of saying no and you're afraid of displeasing other people. So here's the difference 
between an empath and a doormat and as i said um, empaths are susceptible to becoming doormats an empath or someone who's super sensitive is someone who feels the emotions of other people they feel the emotions in in a room when they walk into a room they can sense what other people in the room are feeling they can sense the energy in the room uh, and so when you can sense the energy in the room you kind of know where people are coming from now what you do with that energy that is where the big question comes in are you going to use that energy to kind of think oh okay i like this energy i'm going to hang around longer or are you going to say, use that energy and say oh my gosh the uh all these people here they are suffering they're struggling um and am i going to go in and rescue them now, if you are going in to rescue them, that's all very well. That's great. There's a lot of people that needs rescuing. There's a lot of people that need help. But here's this second piece to it. What differentiates a doormat from someone who really does help people is that the doormat is the person who doesn't take care of themselves when they need taking care of, but they're there for everybody else except themselves that's the big difference you know so ask yourself am i a rescuer am i someone that feels i need to solve the world's problems am i someone that everybody comes to when they need a shoulder to cry on am i someone that everybody offloads their problems on am i that person that everybody can count on if you answered yes you're probably an empath but here's the second piece do i take care of myself do i feel drained all the time do I ever recharge my own batteries? Am I good at receiving? So if you said, no, I'm not good at receiving. No, I don't take care of myself. No, I'm, um, you know, no, I never recharge my batteries. Then it makes you a doormat. You never do this for yourself, but you're doing it for everyone else. So anybody relate to that, please comment. And even though I'm not reading the comments right now, I will shortly because if you have questions about this subject, please, please ask me them and I will get into it. So here's a couple of things I wanna say. If you relate to what I just said, number one, and, and this is really provocative and people don't always like it when I say this, but I'm gonna say this because I'm speaking from my own experience conventional spirituality conventional spiritual teachings do not work for empaths they actually turn you into a doormat this is what happened to me and i'm talking about conventional spirituality it i'm not making a blanket statement about all spiritual teachers you may have a spiritual teacher that frees you liberates you that is wonderful the question you have to ask yourself with whoever you're following, whatever you're reading, whatever self-help you're reading, everything you're doing, is it making you feel empowered or is it making you feel more in bondage and smaller? Is it making you love yourself more, which is what you're supposed to do, or is it making you feel you need to be more self selfless and do more for other people? So, um, so let me give you some solid tangible examples so you know what i'm talking about before i had my near-death experience i used to think i had to work at being more spiritual and by doing that i used to follow uh, conventional spirituality where i where i would actually listen to messages like I had to um, I had to suppress my ego the ego is evil I had to push it down I had to let it go now let me tell you that is one thing that does not work well with empaths because the ego is the part of you that makes you that allows you to express who you are to the world so if you are somebody who is not an empath not super sensitive but you're somebody who already is somewhat um, uh, let's say power hungry greedy narcissistic uh, you don't want more of that in the world <clears throat> so it's quite all right those spiritual teachings would apply to you because you want that person to have a smaller ego so they're not magnifying those traits into the world the ego magnifies your traits into the world now the problem is spirit conventional spirituality attracts a more empathic audience 
And so the message is landing on the wrong people. But we do need empaths and sensitive people to embrace their egos because we do want that quality magnified and shared with the world. The world needs you. If you're sensitive, if you're empathic, the world needs you. Hence the title of my new book, which is coming out next year, is called Sensitive is the New Strong. The reason why our world is so messed up is because the message of squashing your ego and suppressing your ego and all that and and all the other messages that it's selfish to love yourself and all these messages are falling on the wrong people they're landing on the wrong people they're landing on the people who are doing it already they're landing on the people who are already being of service to the point of draining themselves and and becoming doormats. And these are the people receiving the message that we have to be of service. We have to squash our ego. Um, we have to give and give of ourselves. And it's selfish to receive. It's landing on the people that are already doing that to the point of making us drained that... Um, we're dimming our lights and so in so while we're doing that the world is being taken over by the people who are not attracted to these messages anyway so so this is my point i actually believe that spiritual messages need to empower you they need to empower the people who are attracted to these messages and the people attracted to these messages are a more docile more empathetic more sensitive audience and what you need to be told is that the world needs you it needs to hear from you embrace your ego so that you can take more leadership positions we want our leaders to be conscientious, aware, empathic, sensitive. We don't want our leaders to, to be the narcissistic ones who, um, who are less aware of, uh, uh, who are less consciously aware of the universe and the needs of other people. So this is what I mean. So when I, before I ever had the cancer even, I used to go to all these different spiritual um, classes and teachings thinking I needed to work at myself being more spiritual and every message I got was telling me the same thing that I had to serve more I had to squash my ego so I would keep doing that and, and that it was selfish to love myself and I did that to the point of becoming a doormat to the point of draining myself until I actually died and it was only when I died and I don't want you to have to die to learn this and this is why I share this message as it was only when I died did I realize oh my gosh I'm supposed to be sensitive and empathetic and I'm supposed to share that with the world it's more human to be that way not less human and I'm supposed to embrace my ego because it's a part of who I am and if we don't embrace our egos we can't take on leadership positions we can't shine our light when you squash your ego what you're doing is you're squashing your light you're dimming your light when you don't love yourself you're dimming your light as well i realized that in fact every single one of us is already spiritual we are spiritual beings and we are running around trying to be something we already are and the metaphor, the analogy, which I use is, I've probably overused it, but I'm going to use it again, is that if you, uh, you know, what Michelangelo said when he was asked how he carved those beautiful statues of angels out of those clumps of marble, those rocks of marble. And he said, the angel was already there. I just chipped away and set the angel free. So this is the thing, what well, we are already spiritual. We just have to let go of what is not us and set ourselves free. Who we truly are is already spiritual. We don't have to worry about whether we have a big ego or a small ego. People who are empathic don't actually have to worry about such things. People who are connected to the emotions of others, um, if you are that person where everybody cries on your shoulder, where everybody comes to you to solve their problems, you are the rescuer. If you are that person and you relate to being empathic, then you do not have to worry about your ego. You do not worry have to worry about being selfish. In fact, 
you need the opposite of conventional spiritual teachings so that you can replenish yourself so that you can feed yourself and charge your batteries because the world needs more people like you it doesn't serve the world for someone like you for whom someone like you who are naturally empathic naturally a rescuer you really need to look after yourself and learn to receive I bet you're very good at giving and terrible at receiving. That's another clue. If you are that type, you need to learn to receive. You need to learn to say no to what is not you and what is not yours. You need to learn to receive. You need to learn to charge your batteries. You need to learn to love yourself. You need to do these things because the world needs people like you to go out there and shine your light. They don't want you. The world can't handle you suppressing your ego and dimming your light and draining your batteries and becoming discharged and being sick because and that's why the world because our paradigm doesn't support you doing that our conventional spiritual teachings don't support you doing that this is why our world is so upside down right now and so messed up um I speak about this in my book, um, What If This Is Heaven? And this is exactly the paradigm I speak about, is that we live in an upside down world where we're taught the wrong things to live happy, healthy lives and the wrong things to make this world a better place. We're taught the opposite. Um, so I speak about it in my book and, and, and also at all my events, I get into more detail about this and exercises about how um, how we can get into it. But I think that even knowing this, just becoming aware that you're an empath, you can actually take steps to help yourself to prevent yourself from becoming a doormat. Another thing that empaths struggle with is, is money. And it's a common one for many empaths. They struggle with making money because they're always more concerned about other people who have less. I would want you to know that it doesn't help other people if you're broke and you're poor and you're struggling with money. So you really need to check your receiving channels and don't be afraid to receive because I would rather an empath or a super sensitive person um, accumulate abundance than someone who's going to hoard it and someone who's greedy rather than someone who's greedy who makes the who makes money off the backs of poor people or who exploits people i would much rather someone who's super sensitive who's aware of the needs of the world and who's conscientious and who's an empath i would much rather someone like that receive a lot of abundance i would happily pay them for for their services and you need to know that you need to know that if you're an empath you need to open those receiving channels never worry about being greedy because you're the kind of person whose heart will go out and help other people that's a given you don't even need to think about that part the part you need to think about is about helping yourself and that's why i keep reminding people Practice a random act of kindness to yourself because you're probably already practicing it for everyone else. You're probably already giving everyone else. So here's a couple of steps that you can start with. Number one is check how good you are at receiving and learn to receive something every single day, even if it's something that you're doing for yourself, whether it's soaking in a tub or catching that movie that you keep saying you don't have time to catch or meditating or something. Treat yourself to something every single day and learn to receive. <clears throat> the other thing is ask yourself, where am I saying yes when I mean to say no? So um, ask yourself, like, what have I taken on that I haven't wanted to? Now, sometimes um, there are things that we have to say yes to. Maybe we have special needs children or aging parents. And of course, we feel for them and we want to help them. And that's great. You know, I, I'm in a situation where both Danny and myself have aging parents and we try to be there for them whenever we can, even when it's difficult we, for us we're there when they need us and the way that we're able to do that is to take care of ourselves so that we have the strength and energy to handle that so check where you're saying yes just because you're afraid of displeasing people and because one of the biggest downfalls for doormats 
is the the reason why we become doormats is because we are afraid of disappointing people so ask yourself am i saying yes because i'm afraid of disappointing them or am i saying yes because i really want to do this i want to do this because i love that person or i want to do this because it's fun or because it brings me joy so ask yourself that and if it's because you're afraid of saying no, you're afraid of disappointing people, that's the area you need to work at. Because believe me, when you start to say no to things that you don't want to do, that's when you free up that energy reserve that helps you to stop being a doormat. And in terms of how to say no, there are gentle ways of saying no. Number one is to know that you're not a bad person for saying no. Because every time you say yes when you, when you mean no, you're actually saying no to yourself. You're saying yes to the other person, but you're saying no to yourself. It's time to start saying yes to yourself. And as I said, there are gentle ways of saying no. You could always, instead of instinctively saying yes to everything that comes your way, <clears throat> you can start to say, hmm, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. That's one way that I do it to give me time to process it more and then come up with a gentle way of saying no if it is going to be a no. You can say, my schedule doesn't allow it. You can say, I would love to do it, but my schedule doesn't allow it at this time. Or you can say something like, um, you know, I'm just feeling really tired at this point. And maybe check back with uh, check back with me in whatever a week a month six months so don't be afraid to say things like that now I'd love to hear from you from your um, I'd love to read some of your questions so let me check out my Facebook page and let me see the um, let me read some of your questions and as I said please tell me if you relate to everything I've said and whereabouts in the world that you're writing from and hopefully if you're somewhere in Europe or in the UK hopefully uh, if you're going to be at one of my events please comment in the comments below as as well so here we go I've got to make sure that I silence the uh, volume and yeah, I see you. Question, I have a situation of abuse. This is from Artie Bello. I have a situation of abuse. I finally report this, but the fact is that I report the situation might not have any results. I'm feeling angry, don't know how to deal with this. Can you give some advice about difference between defending yourself and forgiving? Excellent question. And I always avoid conflict, but in this case, and okay, so here's the thing. People who are doormats, uh, they are also conflict avoidance people. So check this. If you are someone who avoids conflict, chances are you are a doormat. Um, doormats are backed into a corner because they do everything they can to avoid conflict. Um, so let me see. I just want to make sure that I articulate this properly. Um, if you're someone who's conflict avoidance, some of those things that I just said about saying I'll get back to you or uh, is always very helpful but if you feel that you are being exploited if you feel that you really need to get out of a situation um, what ends up happening this is a common pattern for doormats is that because you can't say yes uh, sorry because you can't say no you end up saying yes and then the person comes back for more and you say yes again and the person comes back for more and you say yes again but now by this point you're ready to explode you now feel abused and the reason that's happened is because you didn't say no in the first place you have been dishonest in that when you have wanted to say no you kept saying yes and yes and yes and now you've gone so far you're feeling abused you're feeling exploited and you end up exploding and then that person says oh my gosh what did I do you were cooperating with me you said yes all along and and now you're being made to feel like the bad person for saying no and you've just got yourself into a conflict situation anybody relate to that so this is why it's really important to identify 
right from the onset that this is where I want to say no, but I'm having trouble. Can I come up with an alternative answer and say, let me think about it. Okay, so let's say you didn't do that and now you're in too deep and you're in this conflict situation. The best thing that I can think of at this point is to be really honest with the person you're with. And it can be really challenging, but to be really honest and say, look, um, I didn't, I should have said no in the first place. Um, I said yes out of, in a moment of weakness, and but really this is not working for me. Let's work out a situation to make this amicable and let's see if we can part amicably. So I just want to tell you here though, that this is the mistake I made when I was talked into an arranged marriage. I wanted to say no and I felt backed into a corner. Um, I was afraid to say no. I was told things that if I say no, other people would be reluctant to marry me within my community. So I said yes to the engagement. As the months went by, I wanted to break it up, but I didn't have the courage. I kept going because I couldn't say no. I couldn't back out. And eight months we were engaged and then all the arrangements were made, the venues were booked, people had flown in for the wedding, the halls, the video people, the, you know, if anybody knows anything about an Indian wedding, it's a huge affair. And three days before the wedding, I really couldn't go through with it. And I ran away. And because I ran away, I was the one that ran away. And as I said, everything was organized. People had flown in from all over the world to attend the wedding. And I was seen as the unreasonable person, the bad person, the, the person that caused the conflict. Had I broken it up months earlier, it wouldn't have been as bad. But I was the one that caused shame to his family, my fiance's family, and my family. And I was ostracized from my, from my community for a long, long time. And people said, gosh, you were really brave to run away three days before the wedding. No, actually, I was a coward. I should have done it much, much earlier. I'm a classic conflict avoidance person that left it till the last minute because I didn't have the courage to say no from the start. And so let that be a lesson. That was a lesson for me. But let that be a lesson to you as to what can happen. You can get yourself deeper and deeper into trouble. And that was the big lesson for me. It's much easier to say no early on than when you're in it too deep. So please, please don't make that mistake. Um, so here we have, hi, Janet Graham. It was in a situation that I said yes, but changed my mind. It didn't feel new friendship strain. Now friendship is strained. Okay, if the friendship is strained because of that, that friendship was not meant to be. The people who are your friends will be your friends regardless, and they will love you for who you are. They will love you for your ability to say no. So one of the reasons why we're unable to say no is because we're afraid we'll lose friendships. We're afraid of being unpopular. We're afraid of disappointing people. So after I had my near-death experience and I learned why it was I got cancer, and this is why I really, one of the passions, um, one of the driving forces behind me sharing my message is because I know that when you take on so much, when you're an empath and you take on everybody's problems, it really can lead you to the point of getting sick. And that's why I share my message. I know why I got cancer. I know I drained myself by putting myself last and putting everyone else first. So anyway, um, one of the things I learned was that if I don't say no, I will get sick. But if I say no, I risk losing friends. And that was the choice I had to make. Risk getting sick again, risk being that person I used to be that got cancer who couldn't say no, or risk losing friends. I took the risk losing friends. And what I learned was that yes, I did lose some friends, but they were my friends for the wrong reason. So they're not really friends. They didn't love me unconditionally. But the friends that stuck around and the new friends I made were real friends because they loved me for who I really am underneath as the person who has, um, you know, as the person 
who has opinions as the person who's not afraid of conflict yes of course i still fall into the old patterns sometime um, sometimes and you will fall into the old patterns it's very hard for people who are super sensitive and em empathetic to make a true transformation because every now and then you do fall into the old patterns because for whatever reason you've been programmed to be that way and think that way but it helps to be aware that you're doing that it really does it helps to be aware and that's the first step it helps to be aware that you don't have to worry about being selfish or a narcissist or any of those things you don't have to worry about those that's not in your cosmetic makeup so don't worry you in fact have to worry about the opposite you have to worry about not loving yourself enough. So you actually consciously have to work at loving yourself more than other people, more than people who are not doormats, who are not empaths. You consciously have to actually work at loving yourself more. You really do. You have to love yourself like your life depends on it because it does. So let's take one or two more questions. Um, oh, Sanya. Sirkovic, I'm counting days till May 26 to meet you in Zagreb. Yes. I mean, this is such an exciting trip. And that's your birthday present from yourself. Aw, happy birthday to you, Sonia, Sonia. And I look forward to meeting you too in Zagreb. So I'm going to be in Croatia in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be in Paris. And also um, we're doing a couple of cities in Germany. And I'll, I'll be speaking here in Basel tomorrow and this weekend. So I'm really looking forward to meeting some of you. Um, for some reason, it's always very hard to get the get the questions before they they shoot by. Hi, Vina Shetty. Yes, love yourself like your life depends on it because it does. Beth O'Neill, how would you deal with someone who says things to push your buttons to get a rise out of you? Had this happen this morning? Yes, I know that feels awful, doesn't it? Um, I would make a mental note of two things. One is what was it that pushed my buttons so that and I would actually do some work on it so people can't push those buttons but secondly i would also make a mental note to avoid that person especially if they did it deliberately if they're trying to push your buttons deliberately then um they're not somebody that you really want to hang around with too much um the the other thing is claire brown okay the other question another question claire brown what about if you're in one of those manipulative relationships with an energy vampire? Wow, it makes it so hard to say no and walk away. I eventually did it, but literally took years. Wow, you have my sympathy. My heart really is with you, Claire Brown. I would suggest you check out the work of Christian Northrup. She's very, very powerful in this area. When it comes to relationships, particularly relationships, with people who absolutely drain your energy and if you're an empath um christian northrup has just written a book called dodging energy vampires and i i think that would be really helpful for you and check out her um her interviews in fact what we'll do is um i will post in the comments a link to the hay house world summit in that world summit christian does a beautiful interview exactly on this subject about people draining your energy if you're an empath and it's a great interview it's in this week's hay house world summit which has a hundred free interviews i have an interview in there about living heaven on earth or about creating heaven on earth in a paradigm that actually fosters the opposite and how to do it so check out those interviews i think you'll find that really useful Ma Louisa Leal. Hi, I'm really confused. I've been incredibly happy all my life and have the blessings that even in bad times I've been able to find a way to feel good. That's great. Um, but suddenly cancer started to affect my lungs in a rude way. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. So, okay, so now I have a couple of videos on how to deal with illness. So what um, what I would suggest, first of all, is to start to do things. I have, 
Oh my gosh. Okay. So if you would listen to my interview on this current um, world summit, Hay House World Summit, I have a meditation in that interview. It's completely free. We're going to post the link to it in the comments. So please look for it. We will post a link to it also under your question. And in that interview, I have a meditation which takes you, it's a short meditation, but it takes you through having your own little near death experience. And in that, you will get some answers. I also want to ask you to tune into your body, ask the your lungs which is where you're seeing it why what is the message it has for you ask the question before you go to bed at night and see what answers come to you your body your higher self will answer you i have a couple of videos on it on my youtube channel please check my youtube channel i forget the titles but the videos are one of them is on how to support a loved one who is going through an illness that will help you even if you're going through an illness even if it's not for a loved one and another one is what would i do differently knowing what I know now, if I had to face an illness again. Um, so please check that one out. I think those will be very, very helpful for you. I am sending you my thoughts and wishes. And um, I want to thank you all for tuning into this Facebook Live. Truly, thank you. Um, I'm ever so grateful to all of you. I'm so grateful to Wayne Dyer for tuning me into all of you and for helping me get my book published so that I could do what I do today, which I absolutely love. And I look forward to meeting you on my travels, whether it's here in Europe, um, whether it's in Zagreb or, or Germany or in Switzerland or in UK and Bristol or in America or anywhere else. Please stop by and say hello if you're at any of my events. And please um, just say hello to me on Facebook. I love hearing from you. I love getting to know you. And I look forward to connecting with you again soon on the next Facebook Live or at an event. Thank you all. Bless you all. See you all soon. Bye. Mwah.